Thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, a pleasure to be at the uh, conference today. So, yeah, the, uh, we'll jump right into the, the presentation. And uh, really excited to tell you about what, uh, what is not only a very exciting asset, but a, an exciting company that we're building here in the Silver Valley in Northern Idaho. You know, we're, we're taking a uh, historic asset that has a tremendous mineral endowment in uh, one of the most prolific uh, silver districts in the United States. We're bringing in a, uh, a uh, excellent management team and we're coming into the uh, property with a very new and modern vision and approach. And what's great about it is that, uh, you know, that you can see a pathway to, to a rapid restart while at the same time having exceptional leverage to the, uh, to the silver price, which is, uh, which is all going to lead us, we believe, to uh, have Bunker Hill be the cornerstone asset of a large, uh, modern, USA-focused silver mining company going forward. I just want to take a little bit of time and talk about the Bunker Hill um, mine and the asset that, that we're working on. Um, it, it started operation in the late 1800s and uh, operated continuously through 1981. In that operate through that operations uh, period, you know the asset really was a cornerstone and a foundation of the of mining in the Western United States. It was instrumental in, in supporting the United States through the Industrial Revolution, two world wars, as a primary producer of lead and zinc. What's interesting is that over that period of time, there was 165 million ounces of silver produced completely and solely as a byproduct. No real operational or geologic focus on that. Um, through that uh, period of time, uh, environmental regulations and the expectations around environmental performance were very different than they are today. And uh, as that began to change with, the, uh, with a focus in the late 70s, early 80s on, on the environment, um, it eventually led to the uh, mine being shut down. Uh, it became a Superfund site in uh, 1983. And, uh, and that's what ultimately led to its closure. Since that time, uh, the mine has been on care and maintenance and the, uh, the EPA and the state of Idaho uh, working together have, um, have conducted a cleanup, not only of the mine site itself, but of the entire Silver Valley. Um, fast forward 40 years and, uh, and we have uh, brought in a new management team with a new focus and, a, and certainly the, uh, you know, the uh, intent to build a very modern company at the forefront of environmental practice. And what we saw when we looked at the Bunker Hill as an asset is we saw a, a phenomenal mineral endowment and, and a site that has uh, environmental challenges that are very, um, very able to be addressed with the right focus and the right approach. So we started here uh, about a year ago just, I actually uh, moved to Kellogg uh, on the 14th of April last year, and, and we got started. And, and what we start, had to start with was 100 years worth of operating history and uh, an enormous uh, treasure trove of geologic information, technical information. There was literally thousands and thousands of meticulously created uh, mylar maps of the geology. Uh, there's 3,500 historic drill holes with drill hole logs and assays. The problem was that it was essentially just stacked in a storeroom. Uh, all of that information was, was really not usable in any way, shape, or form. So we started our process here uh, by focusing on getting that, all of that information digitized, analyzed, and, uh, and, and into a 3D geologic model that we could, uh, you know, that we could actually work with and, and advance the project uh, from a technical and geologic standpoint. Um, that led to us doing a, a, a modest drill campaign. Uh, and, and with that, we were able to publish our first resource in September, right around, uh, right at 9 million tons. Um, we've since followed that up with an updated resource where we made a significant uh, conversion and upgrade from inferred to indicated material. And that's the basis of the PEA that we're working on now, which will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. In conjunction with that, you know, we also focused on, uh, on water quality and improving the water quality, which is the primary challenge and environmental focus here at, at the Bunker Hill mine. And, and when, I, when I'm talking about that, it's, the, uh, it's acid mine generation. And, and uh, we, we've been able to come in 
and uh, and look at the uh, historic information, uh, actually get boots on the ground into the mine, focus and understand where that problem is uh, created, and really take some um, you know some great first steps into addressing that. Um, so what I will say is that uh, all of the water that comes out of the mine uh, reports to the to a, a central water treatment plant that is uh, owned and operated by the EPA. The water is uh, treated to discharge quality and, and then is discharged into the environment from there. Uh, but in that line, when you look at Bunker Hill from a long-term perspective, which is the way that we're looking at this mine, we're looking to have a sustainable environmental performance you know, over the extremely long-term. And that means that uh, we, we need to get into the mine and we need to address that water management challenge, which we've done and are beginning to do. We've uh, initiated a, a pre-treatment plant and isolating and focusing on that problem in the, in the underground mine. We've already had some pretty significant initial results uh, with you know, a 70% reduction in the metal load coming out of the mine, which is fantastic. Uh, so really, we'll talk about Bunker Hill. What is, why Bunker Hill? What's the value proposition? I think number one um, and number two, you know, we have an exceptional leadership team. We'll talk about the team, introduce them in a moment. And we have a, a world-class mineral endowment here uh, at the Bunker Hill mine. You know, it's a, it's a deposit that was being mined for over a hundred years. And when the mine closed, it was not for any way, shape or form for uh, depletion of the resource. It was, it was almost solely to the changing environmental landscape and and the, uh, and the cost of modernizing at that point in its history. Uh, our, our vision is to come in and uh, use Bunker Hill to be the cornerstone asset of a very modern, sustainable, and forward-looking mining company that will ultimately grow to be multi-asset, US-focused, uh, with certainly a focus on silver. And, uh, and the asset really kind of, to a certain extent, drives the strategy. And that is that uh, you know the existing resource that we have in place is ideally um, is ideally placed to allow us to get a, a fast and quick restart into operation, begin generating cash flow, and then use that cash flow to realize the silver potential through an extensive exploration program focused on unlocking some of the silver um, potential that we believe exists in in the operation. So a little bit about the team. Uh, Richard Williams, our executive chairman, uh, was the former chief op operating officer uh, at Barrick, uh, and in Barrick he led a uh, he led a pretty substantial turnaround. and uh, And through that time, I got to know him working as the uh, general manager at the Lamoana Copper Mine, which is one of those sites that we had a we had a fairly uh, major turnaround effort in, in place. Um, Along with us, uh, when we started, when we first came to the company, was Brad Barnett, the Vice President of Sustainability. He was the former head of closure at Barrick, and so he uh, he really managed and drove all of the closure sites in Barrick's portfolio, uh, several of which were Superfund sites in the Western United States. So he's certainly ideally placed to uh, help us structure and drive forward our environmental and, and social responsibility from that perspective. Uh, early this year, David Weens joined us as the chief financial officer, and he was a former, he, he comes from the investment banking world, but also the uh, finance world in, um, in, in the mining industry, the, the uh, mid cap mining space. Um, he was with SSR through their growth trajectory and was able to help guide them through uh, on a financial side. And he's been a tremendous asset as we move forward to the point where we are beginning to put together a PEA. And look at uh, and look at uh, financing a restart and getting back into operation. So we have an exceptional team uh, focused on the future with the right uh, with the right uh, skill set across the board, and uh, and we're hard at work here at the Bunker Hill. Uh, in addition, we uh, we re re revamped and uh, and updated our, our board of directors. We brought on Pam Saxton uh, as our audit chair. She has 30 years of financial leadership experience in mining in the Western United States, and is absolutely fantastic. And Cassie Joseph, who is the uh, uh, general counsel at Nevada Copper and has a long track record of success 
in uh, environmental and corporate law. Uh, tremendous assets to the team that we can call on. So where is the mine located? We're here in the Silver Valley. Um, for those familiar with the Silver Valley, Hecla operates the Lucky Friday mine on the eastern extent of the valley. Uh, Bunker Hill is on the, uh, on the far western extent of the Silver Valley. And in between us, the, we have the America's Gold and Silver uh, Core Galena Complex. Uh, and in care and maintenance, you have the Crescent Mine, the Sunshine Mine, and, and a couple of others there. So we're certainly you know, in the right space uh, when you're looking at silver mining uh, in, in North America and, and the Silver Valley of Idaho. So a, a little bit about the geology. What you see here is some of the uh, results of that uh, digitization effort that, uh, you know, that I talked about. Uh, and, and what became clear is that, uh, is that the geology is, uh, is, is tremendously favorable for, for mineralization. And, and what you can see here is the, in red, you have the, the, uh, the first mineralizing event that occurred at uh, the Bunker Hill complex, which was the uh, zinc dominant mineralization. Uh, the secondary to that and uh, several million years after was a silver enriched galena mineralization. Where those two mineralizing events intersect, you have hybridization and enrichment across all three primary metals, lead, zinc, and silver. And, uh, and really, you know, the, what the digitization has allowed us to do is really visualize, understand the geology. And I think I, what's important to understand here is that in the late 70s, just before the mine chain uh, went into closure, there was some very interesting PhD work uh, done out of the University of Idaho, looking at the, uh, at, at the Bunker Hill geology. And at that time, it was determined that uh, as opposed to what was previously thought, all of the faulting at the site was post-mineralizing. So for a hundred years, the, the, uh, the deposit was mined with a faulty geologic understanding. And with that new geologic understanding, what it's able to, enabled us to do is really look at the mineralization and understand uh, to a greater extent what, what the uh, exploration potential and what the upside uh, at the mine truly is, which is really quite an exciting place to, uh, to be. So we really are, um, we are really taking, taking um, a mine that was a, had a fantastic legacy in the past, um, albeit with some uh, social and environmental challenges. We absolutely understand, recognize that. We, we tackle that head on and, uh, and we're, going to, uh, we're going to be a very forward focused, ESG focused company as we go forward. And I just wanna talk about governance for a minute because I've spoken a lot about environmental, the environmental side of things, uh, but it, it's more than that. Uh, you, when the Bunker Hill mine closed in the Silver Valley, um, you know, the, the, it, it caused a tremendous amount of social upheaval that you know, the Silver Valley in, in some ways is still recovering from. And as we move forward, that community revitalization, empowerment is just as important to us as the environmental stewardship. And then on top of that, you know, the corporate governments and the transparency, you know, we really firmly believe that that is where a, a strength and the success of an organization over the long term is, uh, is really founded. You know, and, and so we're really very focused on that and we take it very, very seriously. And we see it as, a, um, as a, an area where we are gonna create value as a company going forward. That's going to allow us to manage risk and take, take uh, advantage of opportunities as they come along. Just a little bit more about the, uh, the, the water treatment and, and the water uh, management that, that we're doing. Um, you know, the, the, we are testing a pretreatment plant and, uh, and we've already, as I said, achieved a 70% metal reduction from the, the mine effluent. And that's, a pretty, that, that, that's really pretty exciting when you think about, you know, that this mine sat here for, for over 40 years and within a year's worth of time with a focused effort, we've been able to come in and, and achieve a result like that. It's really pretty exciting. And uh, we expect to uh, be able to deliver results um, well in advance of that going forward. And I think I would at this time, you know, I'd encourage everybody to go and look at our website. Uh, one of the things that we are, that is fundamental to the culture that we're, we're building as a company is the idea of radical transparency. So if you go to our website, 
you can look and you can see in real time the uh, quality and the quantity of the water that, that is coming out uh, of the mine and reporting to the uh, EPA water treatment plant. And, uh, and you can expect that in, in all aspects of our operation, you know, the, this concept of radical transparency, you know, putting the information on our operating performance out there in, into the uh, public space and allowing our results to speak to ourselves, that's fundamental to the culture and our DNA and, who, and the company that we're building. So I do want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the PEA. We're really pretty excited about that. Should, we should be publishing that um, here in the next week or so. You know, we're actually, we have the technical teams hard at work. And uh, just before this, I was speaking to him. And, and of course, I'll be right back into, into that uh, after we get off of this uh, presentation here today. Uh, but when you think about the mine, you can kind of think about it, and we think about it in three phases. And and what makes us so excited about it is that that first phase, right up at the top of the mine, that's accessible uh, by uh, modern mechanized mining equipment. Uh, we have great accessibility to the ore body. And that's roughly a third of the uh, 10 million tons of uh, inferred and indicated uh, re resource that is on the books right now, which will be the uh, focus of the PEA. So we can get started in, in a really a low cost, um, and, and accelerated manner in the upper areas of the mine. And we can take that cash flow and look to reinvest in exploration, um, which is really pretty exciting. Uh, one of the things, there's a couple of interesting things and unique um, areas that in the PEA that you'll see when it, when it comes out. We'll be looking at doing uh, underground processing and underground tails deposition. That does a couple of things for us. Not only does it help us on the operating cost side, uh, but it allows us concurrently to mining to address the uh, predominant environmental concern, which is acid mine generation. As we deposit the low porosity paste back into the areas of the mine that are high in sulfide and are the genesis point for the acid mine drainage, we'll, be, we'll create and, and eliminate the uh, chemical reaction that is taking place. And that'll have a huge impact on, on uh, acid mine generation, not only while we're operating it, uh, but as the mine um, and, and create a long-term sustainable um, from an environmental perspective operation well past the mine's operating life. Uh, because of the low capital nature of the restart, because of the you know, extensive amount of infrastructure predominantly underground, you know, we're looking at a very low capital um, restart in the PEA. I think we'll surprise some people with the with the capital number that that it's going to take to actually get us back into operation, uh, that capital number coupled with the uh, coupled with the you know the the mineral endowment, we think is going to uh, place us very um, very favorably on the on the uh, all in sustaining cost curves for both zinc and silver. It would be important to note that uh, the PEA you will see that it will be zinc dominant from a revenue perspective. Uh, that, that's really a, um, a, uh, a result of the resource as it existed when the mine went into closure in the 1980s. And that focus on lead and zinc uh, during that part time of the mine's operating life. We believe that with a silver focused exploration, we can rebalance that. And the intent is to become silver dominant uh, over time as we move forward. A little bit about exploration now, quickly. Uh, we're focusing our exploration efforts in the upper areas of the mine. Uh, there, there it, it is a, and that's for two reasons. One, there's there's a great targets and and highly prospective geologic formations up in the mine that have been identified and that we're testing. Uh, two areas in particular there, you can see historically there was a 20 plus ounce silver mine from outcrops in veins on the surface in the late 1800s, early 1900s. That was mined down, cut off by geologic structures. And we think that there is tremendous merit in uh, identifying uh, where, the, where, those, uh, where those vein segments were uh, uh, displaced and isolated to. And that goes back to the geologic modeling that we're doing. That's really giving us a, a proper geologic understanding and directing our efforts to reacquire those veins. The other reason that we're focusing in the upper areas of the mine is because that's the area that's in the closest proximity to where we'll be mining when we restart. 
And that and exploration success in the upper areas of the mind will most quickly translate into uh, financial performance success and the ability to add and transition to a, a silver dominant uh, revenue position as quickly as possible. But we really are quite excited about the deep uh, exploration opportunities. What's interesting is that in the Silver Valley, the Bunker Hill mine is uh, is one of the shallowest and and the sh and is actually the shallowest of the major mining operations. But the deepest level is only just a little over 4,000 feet deep. Uh, and you compare that to some of the other mines that are well over seven or 8,000 feet. You know, so uh, there's a lot of unexplored down dip exploration potential at depth. Uh, in addition to that, there's indications in the historic drill holes, the historic production reports, that as the mine was getting deeper, that the uh, you know that the grades were increasing. In particular, there's a concept of, of uh, silver zonation, where there's indications that the mineralization is actually transitioning to a silver dominant depositional environment at depth, and that would be characterized by a significant increase in silver grades as the lead grades begin to drop off. So we're really excited about that in the long term, but for the near term. We're focused on getting the mine back into operation, generating cash flow, exploring and adding uh, the and and accessing the uh, the mineral potential and the exploration potential in the upper areas of the mine, uh, and, and then fund that work over the longer term through out of cash flow. So just to wrap up, you know, I want to say, you know, why Bunker Hill? Remind everybody again, we're a new leadership team. We joined this uh, and came onto this project because we, we want to build, and it's our intent to build a mining company. You know, we, we don't consider ourselves an exploration company. We're a development company that's going to bring this mine into production and have it be the cornerstone asset of, a, of what will grow over time to be a multi-asset major player in the U.S. mining space in the Western United States. And Idaho is a fantastic place to, uh, st to start that journey. We have a tremendous asset in the Bunker Hill mine. And we have a vision that is very forward looking, focused on uh, sustainability, environmental performance, transparency, and, and collaboration with uh, all stakeholders, state, local, um, and, and federal. And our strategy is to get into operation, restart the mine. Uh, we have what we believe will be a long life, uh, high margin asset. Use, the, uh, use that as a platform to unlock the silver potential in the asset with exploration over time and transition into a silver dominant uh, silver dominant operation. And with that, I think I'll uh, take a few questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. That was an excellent presentation and your corporate culture shone, shone through. And uh, let's see what we have for questions. Deborah is joining us here. Hi, Sam. Nice to meet you. So we have one audience question, which is, does Bunker Hill have rock burst issues? Uh, historically, when you look back at the, um, at the mining records, there was at, at times at the very deepest areas of the mine, uh, there, there was some rock burst, nothing near what you see in some of the other mines in the Silver Valley. And, we, and, and certainly the uh, geotechnical aspects as we, um, increase and go deeper into the mine are going to become a focus. But it's important to understand that, uh, you know, where we're going to start mining, uh, it's just a couple of hundred feet uh, from the surface. And, uh, and although rock bursting and those geotechnical issues will become more complex at depth, uh, you know, the technology and the understanding of how rock stress in, um, interacts with the mining environment has uh, you know, has taken leaps and bounds from where it was when the mine was in operation, and most of that uh, you know can be exceptionally well managed with the right approach with mine planning, with de-stressing, and, and there's technical solutions uh, if and when that becomes a problem. But that's uh, you know that's in the in in the distant horizon. It's certainly not going to be a consideration uh, in, in the first few years of mining anyway. Can you elaborate a little bit on the misunderstanding um, or, um, yeah, the misunderstanding of the mining in the 70s? Like, what was faulty? Excuse me? Uh, could you just repeat that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, 
uh, with the understanding of the mining in the 70s was faulty? Can you elaborate uh, well, on what there, it, or, or what you think you see differently? Well, for most of the mine's history, uh, the mineralization was assumed to be fairly closely associated with the major faults. One predominant major fault in particular, the Kate Fault. And uh, there was some excellent PhD geologic work done um, from, out of the University of Idaho in the late 70s. And, and what they were focused on was the, was the structure, the stratigraphy uh, of the Bunker Hill ore deposit specifically. And what they were able to prove conclusively was that all of the faulting as, um, as opposed to being closely associated with the mineralization, the faulting was post-mineralization. So the, the, vein, the mineral deposition uh, that occurred uh, occurred in a vein structure in the in the quartzites in, in an in the quartzite rock formation in an overturned anticline, and subsequent to that, the faulting occurred and it relocated and displaced and and uh, positioned all that mineralization uh, where it currently is today. So, if you can imagine, for uh, almost a hundred years, uh, you, the approach was. Um, look and explore for ore in close proximity to the, the Kate Fault, which is the predominant uh, fault in the Bunker Hill mine. Uh, and, and that approach, um, when, when you take it and, and you look at it in a different way and you assume that the fault was post-mineralizing, it opens up a whole area, whole areas of the, uh, of the land position and the claim block that were not explored uh, because they're not closely associated or in close proximity to a uh, major faulting structure. All right. I think my choice of wording was confusing, fault versus faulty. So thanks for navigating it. No I think problem. Vanessa, note to self, never to use that term again. <laughs> <laughs> Vanessa, I think you have a, a couple questions as well. Yeah, some audience questions here. Where are you in terms of permitting? Question one, if all goes well, when you when do you anticipate production? Thanks. Well, the, on, on the permitting question, um, the uh, Bunker Hill is in a little bit different position than a lot of mines in the Western United States. So the Bunker Hill mine is encompassed entirely within permitted mining claim or, or patented mining claims on private ground. Uh, so what that means is that uh, is that the regulatory authority that we have to deal that we deal with is uh, the state of Idaho? Okay, so so we do we don't have to um, go through an overarching uh, NEPA process like uh, many of the many of the mines in the Western United States. So that simplifies things tremendously. Uh, there are uh, certainly a, you know a couple of permits that that we need to get. Uh, but there's no overarching operational permit required. Probably the key one in that is the uh, the water discharge permit. But what's important to understand is that the water that is leaving the mine right now is, is already reporting to a uh, EPA uh, water treatment plant, where that water is being treated to discharge qualities and, and being discharged um, uh, in, into the environment. So it's a process of us going through and uh, and um, applying for and, and getting that permit. And we're working on that now. Uh, some of the requirements for that is to have you know, a, a certain amount of uh, background historic water quality samples. Uh, and, and we're in the process of doing that. You know, we take, it takes the team here about two or three days uh, every month to crawl into all of the uh, different locations in the mine. Uh, we have over 30 monitoring points and, and running the, you know, the full analytic suite on, on the water. That in conjunction with the work that we're doing on um, pilot testing for water treatment so that we can understand uh, the, the water and the water geochemistry and how it flows is all, um, is all key to that. Uh, but the water discharge permit is the key permit that we would need. That well, sounds like you have a really great handle having eliminated 70% of the metals, I think you said, in uh, one year alone. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. A uh, question, Sam. Um, did how did this barrack, this this power group of barrack, uh, find Bunker, or did Bunker find the ex barrack team? How did that come about? <laughs> well, I, you know, I think it started 
I'm glad you asked that question because it really started with kind of an ongoing conversation when we were within Barrick. You know, Richard is the chief operating officer, myself as a general manager of uh, the Lamuana mine in Zambia, and Brad as the head of closure. You know, just in the normal course of, of business in Barrick, you know, we had a, a lot of opportunity to engage. And we, we had an ongoing dialogue about where the mining industry is, where, where it's going, and what we thought, uh, you know, that future ought to look like. And um, and I'll just talk a little bit about that. You know, I think, you know, from my perspective, I, I really believe that, you know, the mining industry um, is in a, a period where it's changing dramatically very, very quickly. You know, the demand for metals in the world is, is not getting any smaller. It's continuing to expand. Transition to a green economy is going to take an enormous amount of additional metals. But at the same time, society, is demanding that those metals are um, are accessed and and exploited in a much more sustainable and uh, and and environmentally and socially responsible manner. You know, so I think when you look at the mining industry, from my perspective, you know, I believe that you know that the days of the the multi billion dollar capital investment in risky jurisdictions that result in out oversized environmental and social impacts, I think those days are coming to a close. And I think that uh, I think that what we're doing here at Bunker Hill is much more a model of where the mining industry is going to go and necessarily needs to go. Small footprint, uh, small environmental impact, integrated uh, into the uh, local community, uh, engaging with all stakeholders, and and really focusing on margin and uh, and mine life oversized scale and and, uh, and outsized capital cost. And so how we all came together is that we're all obviously in, in some kind of alignment and agreement on that. And, um, and there's also, we believe, particularly in the Western United States, there's a tremendous opportunity for a, um, for a forward-looking mining company with, with the right approach mm -hmm. to come into assets that are distressed, and really create a lot of value by identifying those areas of distress, focusing on them as a management team, and really uh, delivering an outcome that that is very different for the local communities and the and the environment uh, that, than what was done before. While at the same time, you know, creating significant value. Absolutely, absolutely. Other questions? Um, if if audience participants would like to email us, uh, we can certainly get those answered for you, but we're gonna have to move on. Sam, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you very much.